Hello, Real Vision. It's Tony Greer from TG Macro. I'm excited to have a conversation today with Jason Wild of JW Asset Management. Jason started JW Asset Management in 1999, coming from a position of being a pharmacist. Over the last 20 something years, Jason has built his fund up to a $1.8 billion asset manager. He's heavily involved in the cannabis space, which we're going to get to, but I really want to introduce Jason as a captain of industry that tells an amazing career story. Jason, thank you for coming in and visiting us today. Thank you. It's I really pleasure. appreciate it. You made it into the city during a pandemic and uh, we get to have a great conversation now. So, uh, you know, when my friend Todd Harrison calls me up and says that I have a friend that is as wise as he is humble, I get really excited to meet people in the markets like that. And you have been no disappointment since we started connecting. So let's start right at the beginning. I would love to discuss, you know, the beginning of your career and the path that got you to where you are. And we're going to have a couple of questions along the way. But let's start at the pharmacy, man. You know, you got out of college and you started uh, making drugs. I started making sure selling drugs at least, yeah. <laughs> or dispensing right. them. So I, yeah, I, I got my uh, pharmacy license uh, uh, in the beginning of uh, in the beginning of '98. Uh, practiced uh, pharmacy for uh, for about a year, but around the same time, or towards the end of pharmacy school, I I read the Peter Lynch books, uh, One Up on Wall Street and Beating the Street, and it was all you know, buy what you know. And I was like, well, you know, I should know something about pharmacy and drug stocks and. When I became a pharmacist, all of a sudden I was making at the time $65,000 a year, which was like a ton of money to me. And I only needed like less than half of that yeah, amazingly to, uh, sure. to, to live. So I started investing uh, pr practically every other paycheck uh, in, in the stock market uh, using, uh, using more margin than I probably should have because I didn't know any better. Uh, and that first year, um, I made about a half a million dollars in the stock market, which was a lot more than, uh, than I made as a pharmacist. And I was like, I like this a whole lot better. It's a lot more interesting and, <laughs> and exciting Competitive. than, uh, than uh, you know, dispensing uh, uh, prescriptions. And uh, I decided uh, at the end of 98 that I uh, was going to uh, uh, launch a, uh, a hedge fund. And my view was sort of like, if you build it, they will come. I didn't yeah. really care what I started with because yeah. I felt like I was going to be able to continue to have good performance. So I, started, so I launched the fund with eighty thousand dollars under management. Your money, friends' money, accumulated money. How did, how, did you, money. how did you get your leg into it and start saying, "Okay, we've got a fund. Let's put some positions on." Tell me yes, a little bit. Yes, I, uh, I, I put fifty thousand dollars of my of my own money in. My dad put in like twenty grand, and I had another friend who put in like uh, ten grand, uh, and that's what we got. That's what we got started with, and and. Uh, you know, opened up a uh, brokerage account. I had met a um, uh, fund administrator that would uh, that would sort of do all the, do all the monthly statements for a little uh, you know small little account like me, who I'm still with to, to this day. Really? So, so uh, like so, a prime broker? No, they're they're the administrator. They do all the accounting work and the monthly okay. statements and and the K ones at the end of the year and all Understood. that. So um, yeah, so we got started and uh, got started there in uh, in '99. And um, you know, uh, first 12 years we did all public equities. That was really, um, and, and specialty pharma, which are all the drug companies that, are, that aren't the big cap guys. That was really my, uh, my wheelhouse. I mean, I, uh, I, I thought, I, I like the, the smaller drug companies because A, I could get access to management because who was gonna take a call from this, you know, kid who's running, you know, 200 grand or 500 grand yeah. or whatever it was. Sure. Uh, so I can get access to management to the uh, smaller companies. But also I found that they were much more uh, entrepreneurial and if they were launching a new drug that I thought was going to do well, it could really move the needle much more for them. Yeah. What were the what were the investable themes that you were looking at when you got started? So that was 99, 2000 or so. We're talking about, you know, the Nasdaq 5K. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video. I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. much more for them. Yeah, what were the what were the investable themes that you were looking at when you got started? So that was 99, 2000 or so. We're talking about, you know, the Nasdaq 5K on its way down, yeah. um, you know, into you investing in pharmaceutical stocks, biotech, et cetera. So what were the themes you were going into from then? 
Uh, it was a lot of the, uh, the generic drug companies were sort of a subset of the specialty pharma companies. And, you know, the theme uh, with generics, uh, you know, always was and, and still is just that a larger percentage of overall prescriptions are, are being filled with generic uh, drugs, right. you know, pretty much every year for the last for the last 50 years. Yeah. I knew a lot of people that worked in pharmacies and could say, hey, I can't believe, uh, you know, the price of... Uh, you know, uh, uh, generic drug X Y Z just went up. Uh, you know, six X uh, yesterday. Uh, so, so you I got could channel tell. checks. Yeah, yeah, channel checks. And it was my view was like generics. It was almost like what do they say about real estate? Every market is local, and it's similar sort of uh, with different specific generic drugs. And if they're the best thing you have is to have uh, a company uh, that has a, a, a generic product that is uh, in a lot of demand, that maybe the competition drops out and they have the ability to uh, to yeah. take some uh, price or, or make back some of what it degraded over, over the prior mm -hmm. couple of years. The best situation is to have something like that in a company uh, that maybe doesn't have a lot of other things. So really, uh, you know, that profitability really falls to the bottom line. Right. So, but generally the themes uh, were to uh, keep track of uh, sort of specific uh, products on the generic side that, uh, that companies had and, and, and keep track of uh, demand and, uh, and pricing and competition and who were the other filers that might be coming soon and, 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 and things like that. So you're tactically trading, you know, the, the names that you like that are separating themselves from the pack type of thing. Right, right. That and also meeting with the companies and getting to know management teams and deciding who are the credible ones and, and who are not. Because it's, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like sometimes people on Wall Street oversimplify things and just look at numbers and what's this what's the PE ratio on this or the price to sales and it takes out the fact that all of these companies are run by human beings and right. some do a better job and are more honest than yeah. others you know are, yeah. are, are less so yeah and how tangible does that become when you're sitting in their presence right yeah absolutely and, and sometimes you pick up on things like that by talking to them about things that have nothing to do with their with their company sometimes you just you know some they say something and you're like oh that seems a little uh, yeah you know, a little strange. So you're getting to know these companies and you're, I'm assuming, piled, piling in with leveraged ownership of them to, you know, enhance returns and et cetera, et cetera. Tell me where that took you. You know, yeah. right, you know now you're getting, generating bigger returns, more capital, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure a lot more clients are now picking up right. on your track record and how, how's it going now into the mid uh, 2000s, if we can. Yeah. Yeah. So into the mid 2000s, I mean, we, we were always pretty small and when we got bigger than 80 grand. But we really, uh, in addition to the generics, I really liked, on the branded side, I love the companies that were doing deals. Uh, and I, I felt like uh, I was pretty good at if a company announced that they bought product XYZ from some big pharma company or, or they bought, a, bought another company uh, uh, that, you know, they were merging with another company. I always felt like I, I knew most of, the, most of the products from being a pharmacist uh, yeah. originally. I could always, I always felt like I could pretty quickly evaluate whether it was a good deal or a bad deal. And I just sort of had this, uh, have this ability in my head uh, to uh, figure out sort of how accretive it is. Not, not exactly, but within say 10 yeah. or 15%, yeah. figure out how accretive a, a, a deal uh, would be uh, pretty quickly. I didn't, I didn't need to sit and, and model the whole thing out. And a lot of times we were able to react, you know, pretty pretty quickly. And when the and especially when the fund was smaller, that could certainly make a, a much bigger difference in terms of our, our returns. I love that because that's a little bit of my style of trading. There's no analysis paralysis and there is sort of acting on your instincts, right? And and that seems like it plays a big part in, you know, you've got this massive um, now certainly this massive bedrock platform of knowledge where, you know, you've got an opinion on everybody that you meet in each sector. So you've already, you know, you're already up on that. So that's absolutely that's where you are now. And so I want to go, you know, this, this um, you know, it sounds like I want to get towards the cannabis trade. We yeah. may not be there on a timeline, so, right? But we're getting I can tell we're getting closer. Yeah, no, we're getting closer. Yeah. We're getting closer. <laughs> so by 2010, um, we got the fund uh, from 80 grand to about 25 million in AUM, which was you know, much bigger. I remember when I first started the fund, I told I told a friend of mine, I'm like, if I can just get this thing up to like $2 million. I'll yeah, yeah, happy. yeah. Right. So I always had sort of, uh, I didn't have super high expectations. Um, got it up to $25 uh, million. Up, I think we we're up like about 24, 25% a year, net of fees. Uh, and I ended up, but around 07 or 08, I referred a, a deal between two companies that I was invested in, two public companies. And the company that, that uh, bought, that got this product, it was like, the best deal they ever made. I got them this product for $10 million. They had a few things break their way. And then over the next five years, they made uh, like 100 
over $150 million in profit. Great return. And I put this whole thing together, and what did I get? I got, you know, I got a pat on the back. Piece, right, oh, okay. Nothing, I didn't get a piece. If I got oh. a piece, maybe I wouldn't have decided to do what I did next, but okay. I, uh, I just got a pat on the back, and I, I said to myself, like, you know, I'm meeting, all these companies are coming through my uh, offices. Yeah. They're more open with me than they would be with a business development guy from a, comp from a company that's a competitor to them. So, so like, I can find products and sort of shake loose different, different products. But I'm I'm wasting it if I'm just giving it to somebody where where you know my fund is is not going to be able to make any money off of this. Right. So that's what put the idea in my head of I want the fund to own a pharmaceutical company, and um, that's what we. It took me a couple of years. I found the right CEO to do to partner with me, and in 2010 we announced uh, our first private deal. We bought this small drug company called Arbor Pharmaceuticals for about two and a half million dollars. They were doing like a million and a half in sales. Uh, and it was, we're going to use this as a platform to go out and do deals and to do some lower risk R&D projects and build it into a real company. Brilliant. And it took off, you know, better than I, uh, you know, ever expected. We found two amazing deals uh, that first year in 2010, mm -hmm. where uh, the next year, the company did uh, 127 million in sales and 55 million in pre-tax profit. Within two or three years later, we were doing 100 million in, in profit. Uh, and, uh, and also, we, uh, we also uh, developed, uh, by that point, we developed one of our own drugs that we got approved with what's called orphan drug status, which gives you exclusivity with the FDA. And um, uh, come around 2014, uh, it, it, that was sort of the heyday of all these uh, pharma companies uh, uh, doing, all the, doing inversions where they would move offshore and they were buying everybody up. Uh, and we got approached by, uh, by a few buyers. We decided to run uh, a process and we uh, ended up selling a third of the company to KKR uh, at a $1.1 billion valuation. Brilliant. Which, Brilliant. Yeah, which was, uh, you know, uh, by that point, you know, at that valuation, it was like, Arbor was like 80 some odd percent of my fund. Right. Uh, but the, the great thing about it was, uh, it was interesting. KKR was, was willing to pay more for the company in terms of, from a valuation perspective, if I sold less, if I like said, I'll sell, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, less yeah. Uh, of my position, which I said, I'm fine with, but I want to offer those shares out to my investors that they can sell more right. if they want to. Sure. So it ended up working out and we, and we sort of structured this thing. It was like a, uh, I think like a Dutch auction where I went out to all my LPs of my fund and said, KKR will buy, uh, they're buying 33% uh, overall of, of Arbor and of our stake, but I'm, I've agreed to only sell 5% of my uh, right. position so in there. How much would you so like? So how to much do you with? want to sell? Right. And it ended up working out uh, perfectly. Uh, people who so put in to sell 100% were able to sell 100%. The only catch was we didn't actually we didn't get enough people to sort of uh, tender their their stock. Like we ended up not not uh, being able to come up with enough shares. So anybody who who uh, put in to sell less than six percent, including me, had to sell six, which was that was a yeah, know, yeah, yeah. huge uh, <laughs> huge win. That's amazing. And then it just dovetailed perfectly with cannabis. So right. we had uh, like almost $150 million at this point in cash sitting in my fund. I'm usually a pretty bullish guy and yeah. find things that I want to invest in. Yeah. You know, I think the fund was like, by that point, it had grown to like uh, over 300 million yeah. in total AUM with this big uh, cash position. And I got a call from a banker uh, up in Canada uh, telling me about uh, this company they were raising money for that had a new medical marijuana uh, the, uh, license. I went up there. Uh, sat down with the folks there. First of all, saw the grow. Uh, I had never been in a in a in a grow before. Wow, right? Yeah, uh, the smell sort of hits you in the face when you when you walk into those things. But I sat down with um, with the with the CEO, and he sort of gave me a whole primer on you know what what uh, true medical uses cannabis is. So now you're going uh, into cannabinoids for. and CBD, and you're getting the whole right. And this is already up your alley, so you're like salivating. I can already imagine yeah. what you're like in this conversation right now with with an arsenal uh, sitting with some at cash, your back. Yeah, a little cash burner. Yeah, hole. go ahead. Right. This is getting exciting. So now. Uh, <laughs> yes, and it was yeah. I never heard of CBD before. You remember this was 2014, around 2014. So I went uh, on my way uh, back to the airport in Toronto. I called another banker I knew. I said, I just met with this company. This whole cannabis industry in uh, Canada, it's going to be huge. They're going to be able to export all over the world. It's legal nationwide, not like in the US where you have conflict between state and federal right. laws. Um, I said, you need to introduce me to whoever you know that most of us about the space. I need to meet as many companies as I can. So the flashbangs are going off yeah. immediately. And like you want to have 50 conversations in the next 30 seconds if you can, right? To get up to speed. Exactly, right. exactly. So I ended up over the next 12 months or so, went back up to Canada 
for several trips, crisscrossed the country, did a few, you know, where I started in, uh, in Vancouver, worked my way to Toronto, met with all, pri there were, all the companies were private, right. uh, I believe at that point. And we invested, uh, met with over 30 companies. Uh, we invested in about five of them. We didn't put that whole, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, cash from the from KKR to work, but we uh, we put a decent amount of it to work. And, yeah, and then you know, this is critical near at you know at this. Obviously, we're at a uh, critical phase of your cannabis investing career. Yeah. What made you focus on these five? And if you can talk about a little bit which five and sort of ditch the other ones, because now I see you're a people guy. You're obviously getting to know the heads of these companies and seeing what they're what their power alley is, and you've attached to a couple of them. So can you explain yeah. a little bit of that for us? Sure. So it, it was very similar just to when, if you're investing in any industry, first of all, I got to feel like I trust the, uh, the mm -hmm. management team. Yeah. And you don't know, you know, spending a, you know, meeting with somebody a couple of times, you, you can't always have all the information, but I feel like, uh, you know, instinctually I'm pretty good at like uh, figuring figuring people out, yeah. I and mean, that's just you know I think that helped us even prior to that in terms of different all the different companies we invested in, and uh, you know there's just uh, spend spending time with these CEOs, especially in the Canadian cannabis space. There were a lot of you know uh, not uh, you know very sophisticated uh, you know uh, management right. teams, right. especially relative to you know uh, all the pharmaceutical companies I had historically met in my offices here in New York. Yeah. There were lots of companies that you could just sort of, uh, you know, say these guys, you know, I wouldn't invest with, with them. So we're talking about the CEOs that are coming on CNBC and I'm saying to myself, why isn't this guy put on a suit and tie? Uh, you know what I mean? Just for starters, right? That yeah. kind of thing where- yeah. or where, worse. Or worse, <laughs> okay, got it, got it, understood. So, so and, and back then, so that was a big part of it. It's just, you know, uh, always in terms of our invest, investment process on the private side, and the public side is, uh, is it, are these trustworthy people yeah. that I think are, you know, uh, going to be able to uh, execute on, on the plan. Reputation, yeah. Yeah, exactly. A lot of times uh, business plans don't work out, but what bothers me the most is when they don't work out because the team was dishonest or, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like I got screwed. Right. right. That bothers me more than if somebody went about it and, and had all great intentions. You know, sometimes that doesn't work out as well. Right. But, but uh, you know, the, the- Dishonesty is a deal breaker. Right? Yeah, yeah, at all exactly. Times. Yeah, exactly. Right. In terms of these cannabis names, the other big, the other ways that we evaluated them was, it's funny now in retrospect, because there's too much capacity in Canada, but back in 14 and 15 and 16, it was all about uh, what, your capa what you were building out and what your sort of funded capacity was going to be. Right. So that was, uh, you know, there was no real revenues, uh, you know, in the industry yet. We were like right on the cusp. It was really, we were betting on the dream. Right. Right. So that was another big part of it was, you know, I would go and see their facilities and, and, and see how, uh, how large they were and whether they could uh, uh, attain any real scale in terms of, uh, you know, uh, costs and, uh, you know, and just what they looked like, how clean they were, and, yeah. you know, whether they, uh, you know, whether they, you know, uh, were sort of uh, g growing uh, things or growing products uh, to the standards of what I thought, you know, being more of a pharmaceutical person, I, w I liked facilities that where people took quality seriously. Right. Uh, and, you know, and a lot, of the, a lot of these management teams didn't because it wasn't, these companies weren't run by pharmaceutical people. They were run by people from all different, you know, real yeah. estate or finance or, yeah. or other things like that. That was, so. o that was always my question with the earliest products that I saw and, 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 you know, got to see the packaging of and everything. And I was always wondering like, when are these guys going to make this look like Procter and Gamble stuff? Because that's when it's gone. Yeah. Because I remember that phase being very much about who had the space, who had the branding right, and maybe who had a great sponsor or something like that. Absolutely. So let's keep going. That was a cool phase of the market. And then we crashed. And then we crashed. So, but we didn't crash until uh, right, right, 19. right. So, so 15, 14, 15, 16, invested in a, in a, uh, several uh, companies, uh, uh, five big ones though to start. Canadians. Yeah, the Canadian ones. And fortunately, they, uh, you know, those five ended up becoming some of the leaders in the space. They went public. Uh, but it's interesting because several of them, I didn't really make any money until after they went public. Oh, really? Which is which. That's why uh, overall my fund is structured a little differently than than a lot of other funds out there. A lot of funds are either private equity funds or hedge funds. And we have it, had it as more of a private, and, and my view was always like, was always, you know, I think I'm a good stock picker, so I don't want to have to sell something. If I invest in it privately and then it goes public, I don't want to have to sell it just because I need to distribute the cash. Right. Very often, uh, you know, I, I feel like we can make, a, we can still make a lot more money once it goes public. Sure. So that's what happened here in uh, cannabis, and our largest position was uh, Canopy Growth. 
they ended up becoming one of the uh, leaders in the space and yep. getting a large investment from Constellation you know, a few years later. Yeah, they kicked it off. Exactly. Uh, Organogram was another company that we invested in earlier, uh, on the, uh, you know, say in 2014. Uh, there was uh, Kronos. We were, uh, you know, we were up until beginning of 19, we were a top 10 shareholder in Kronos. Uh, there was another company called Whistler, which stayed private, but was bought by Aurora. Uh -huh. uh, and we invested in CanTrust, which ended up going on to have a, uh, to, a little bit you know, of not disaster. To, yeah, be a little bit of a disaster. But we did, we did pretty well in it because we, uh, we sold it before all of that. Brilliant, happened. brilliant, yes. man. I mean, that was an exciting phase of the market. And so I'm glad I picked some of the right names too. I liked Canopy Growth and Kronos as my favorite. So I'm glad I was looking in the right places. Yeah. Now the story to me is gotten way more exciting. Like, you know, we're, we're at a point now and I don't want to fast forward too far, yeah. but I do want to get to the point where, you know, we've come out of the 2020 election with five more states legalizing. We've clearly got um, Cuomo from New York and Murphy from New Jersey pivoting right into, this, into it right now, right? Tax receipts is an obvious story. This is all happening. And while we're sitting here talking about it, the US MSOs are printing on the highs, right? Yep. So let's backspace a little bit and get into how we got into the US sure. MSOs. Um, and then we're going to talk about what to do here. But I want to go into yeah. your foray from Canada into the U.S. because that seems like a pretty clean, like, okay, this is my next target. Right? Yep, yep. And I had like a real, uh, a specific day that I sort of realized it. So I was, uh, it was 2017. Yeah. I, uh, I was up at one of the, uh, these uh, Canadian banks that would have these uh, cannabis conferences. And I went up to this conference. It was November 17 met with all of my companies that I was invested in. Uh, by this point, our positions had grown substantially. We had invested, say, roughly $30 million uh, US in the space uh, uh, you know, over that period of time. Uh, and these things were now, they, they all went public, they, or most of them did, and, and we had like a $200 million in, invested in the space up in Canada. And I'm meeting with all, my, all of the companies I'm invested in, plus a few other ones that, that I'm not. Uh, and I was talking to uh, Bruce Linton, the CEO of Canopy, in my last mm -hmm. meeting, and I, I remember saying to him, "Man, I just met with all the, uh, you know, all these companies, and you know, I can't believe what a bunch of, uh, you know, friggin' lightweights the vast majority of uh, these management teams are." Yep. And I said to him, "I just, it just sort of hit me when I was talking to him. I said, I feel like I could do something like an Arbor 2.0 here." Because with Arbor, you know, for the first 12 years of, of running my fund, I invested, uh, you know, in pharma, in all non-control yep. positions in the space. They were, they were all public as well, but all non-control positions in the space. I learned the space. I made some money. I built a good network. And then with Arbor, my goal was to bring all that to bear in something that I could have more control over the, uh, over the outcome because I was going to be the chairman and the lead investor. And Arbor worked out, you know, beyond my wildest expectations for right. sure. Right. But I felt like I could do that. I just did the same first part in cannabis for the prior three right. or four years. Learned the space, built the network, made some money. Now I wanted to, especially because I felt like the level of competition was not going to be what it is in pharma. I felt like I said to Bruce, I want to start a company from scratch. And I think, you know, i you know, these other, these other companies have, you know, say three years on me. I'm not worried about catching up to them. Right. So, uh, you know, Bruce's eyes lit up. He's like, you know, you, you should do it. And we want to be involved, you know, uh, through canopy and let's figure it out. He actually flew down to New York the next week to uh, to like see you know what we could structure, and we came up with some ideas of how Canopy could earn equity uh, in this entity if they helped accelerate things for us. Very cool. But then a couple of days later, I got a uh, I got a call from uh, somebody else up in Canada that said, "Hey, you know that company Terrasen that you put uh, 250 grand into uh, 10 months earlier? Uh, the uh, shareholder that owns a third of the company wants asked me if I could find them a buyer." So the light bulb went off in my head because I knew Terrasen already had their license up in Canada and their oh. facility, uh, you know, uh, uh, built out uh, and, and functional. Uh, so I said to him, uh, tell him to give you another day or so that you're going to find them a buyer. I'm going up to Canada tomorrow morning and I'm going to see if I can work out a private placement with the company. And between the placement and the block, we'll uh, essentially have control of oh, this right. and this will be the entity and we'll be you know, two years accelerated. Yeah. So that's what happened. I went up there, I convinced them, they had like a 60, 50 or $60 million market cap. Uh, they had no sales yet and I convinced them. Uh, we, it started out as uh, they agreed to take a $15 million private placement and that over the course of the next uh, two days, I, I uh, convinced them to take $52 million. Uh, which was really, they realized that they were, you know, it was playing with of, somebody real, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and just that, uh, 
uh, you know, I was going to have some say over, yeah. over, you know, what, what, Clearly, the, yeah. Yeah, what was going to happen going forward. But they were, uh, they were all in. That so. would have been the way that I wanted it, right? If I was anywhere near that, you had just built the platform and experienced a similar type of thing twice, right? right? I mean, I just learned that from talking to you. And so they obviously had to say, okay, let's get the man who has just done this in and, and make the decisions. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, and, and the company was put, the difference was this was a public company versus Arbor. Yeah. We did it all privately. Very different. Um, so, we, uh, the stock was around a dollar when I was negotiating this with them. And we, uh, we put in, we bought a $52 million, $52 million worth of stock at a dollar 10. And we got a full warrant at a dollar 10, which was, uh, you know, that was pretty true. If it worked, wow. it was going to, uh, it yeah. was going to work pretty well. <laughs> um, so, we did that. I ended up uh, allowing uh, Canopy Growth and Canopy Rivers to participate in, in it uh, because uh, when I told Bruce that I, that I was gonna do something else, he was a little upset and I said, you know what, why don't you uh, participate in this with me? So I did 60% of the deal and those two did 20% yeah, each. And we also bought together pro rata, we bought two thirds of that block uh, oh, as well. Brilliant. So, uh, so that deal closed in uh, December of 17. Uh, I became the chairman. Uh, you know, it was a little uh, sort of mind blown because the stock doubled the next yeah. day after we announced it, uh, and it was like you know, I was like, I didn't, we didn't even do anything yet, you know. Right, right, and, right. and over the next uh, over the next few months, the stock went to got up to like three, say that in, within the first quarter of 2018. And I remember usually like, uh, you know, I I feel like. Uh, at, at my core, I'm an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and I feel like part of being an entrepreneur is like not being afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember, so I don't usually get anxious around you know business and business ventures and things like that. And I remember being a little stressed out a few months in because I went to three dollars, and we hadn't. I wanted to go out and find some M and A uh, yeah, targets started, and things right. like that. And, and at that point, we were still only our policy for my fund was we would only uh, invest in Canada, nothing in the U.S. where it was illegal. Wow. Um, so. And I remember like saying, like, they're already giving us credit for for doing deals and, and building yeah. this business. I haven't done it yet. It was different with Arbor. We marked it up, you know, uh, because you know, we had PwC would market every quarter. It was based upon the current business. Right. So it didn't get marked up until we after we had all that stuff. Right, in right, the right. House. Yeah. But here it ran out ahead of us. And I was a little uh, I was a little stressed. But uh, in April of that year, I uh, Cowan was having a cannabis conference out in California. They asked me to be on a panel. It was me and uh, several uh, CEOs of the uh, multi-state U.S. multi-state US operators. operators. Oh, now we're talking. And I was like, uh, I was the defender of Canada. You know, only Canada. We're not investing. We don't invest in the U.S. And you know, and from 14 to spring of 18, you made a lot more money in Canada, Canada than sure. you did in U.S. because it was just a place that a lot more people were comfortable investing. Right. Yeah. So, and I was still giving that solar, my, that same spiel that I had been given for the prior three or four years. And then on my way home, I was like, uh, on the flight, on JetBlue, on the way home, uh, on the red eye, I was thinking about it a little bit, and I was like, wait a second, you know, like, the U.S. is a much bigger market than Canada is. The U.S. is a, is a much bigger market in practically every Everything. industry right. than Canada and, and most of the rest of the world. Right. Um, so, you know, maybe just because that trade worked for four years doesn't mean it's going to work forever, and maybe it's going to get turned on its head and go the other way, because... At that point, there was, you know, I think like over $50 billion in value in the Canadian uh, names. And if you looked at the market, the U.S. market, just if you count just the legal states back then versus Canada, the U.S. market was like three or four times the size. And the U.S. market had, had no nothing. No investment. It was no it, There were no, I, th none of those MSOs were even public yet. They right. all started coming public a few months uh, later. Yep. So I felt like there was, that this whole thing was going to go in the other, uh, in the other direction. Mm -hmm. and, and then and the next day... John Boehner announced that he was going on the board of Acreage. Oh, and then right. I was like, that's it. I'm not afraid anymore. Right. I like flipped the switch. They're not, there's too many rich and powerful people now invested in the U.S. Uh, that, that, you know, they're not going to start uh, you right. know, incarcerating people. Right. Or at least, uh, well, unfortunately, they still are incarcerating lots of people all over the country. Um, but they're not going to, uh, you know, they're not going to start going after investors, I guess right. is what I would say. So, yeah, so that was sort of what made us uh, decide to pivot. We pivoted for my fund. Uh, because mm -hmm. we had never invested in U.S. operators there, and also with TerraSend, uh, you know, I came I came back and I was like, we gotta we gotta go to the U.S. Uh, and we just started looking for deals, uh, and we fat, we lined a couple of couple of them up within a few months. We had to have uh, uh, Canopy Growth and Canopy Rivers. We had to figure out how to restructure their shares so we didn't get uh, you know Canopy was on the New York Stock Exchange, yeah. which doesn't allow uh, you know uh, U.S. plant touching uh, companies. Right. So we had to figure out uh, a structure. 
which was uh, we came up with this idea of giving them, uh, uh, letting them trade in their regular shares for uh, exchangeable shares that are only monetizable upon uh, uh, permissibility in the U.S. or these exchanges changing their uh, their position. Kind of like a lot of rules on preferred shares type of thing. Not necessarily. They were regular shares. They were regular shares. Completely regular shares. Okay. Um, and they couldn't even uh, like if if they they couldn't even sell them, which was good for us. They were locked up until they were until it was legal for oh, them okay. to change them for regular shares. All right. So so it was uh, and it took a it took a few months to to. Uh, you know, uh, structure that and get them to agree on it because it was, it was one thing when they invested, I think like 11 million each uh, when we did the first uh, financing, mm -hmm. but the stock had gone up so much um, that now these were over hundred million dollars per, per company. They owned over a hundred million dollars each in this position. And not only did they have to agree to lock it up and they, they couldn't sell it unless it ever became permissible or they were allowed on the US exchanges, they had to actually pay the taxes on the gains. On the gains and stuff. Yeah, so Ooh. it was a, you know, a lot of phantom uh, income. So it took, a, it took a few months to you know, uh, figure that all out and, and convince them that the opportunities that we had in the US were gonna be so much greater than Canada and it was gonna be a great investment for them and a good right. sort of uh, you know, dipping their toe in the water and something in the US. This is before Canopy did the acreage transaction. Got it. So it was really their first uh, US uh, uh, presence. So we got that done. Uh, we had a shareholder vote in November of 18. Uh, and then it, we were like free to go uh, go play. Really? We announced our first uh, uh, big deal uh, the beginning of the following year. We bought the, the Apothecarium, which is one of the nicest chains of uh, uh, dispensary chains in California and San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, let me back up for one second. Yeah. Uh, in the summer, in August, we applied for a license in New Jersey. Oh, wow. And, and our lawyers said, as long as you don't, you know, operate it, then you won't be off sides uh, mm -hmm. because we had not yet, uh, you know, uh, had that, uh, the reorg, which allowed us to be in the U.S. Uh, and we figured we probably weren't going to win it because they were only giving out six licenses. And, and there, there were a lot of applicants, right? There, were, there ended up being 146 applicants for six licenses. So we found out in December of that year uh, that, we, uh, that we won. Wow. So um, um, score, which was huge. We uh, we got we had the second highest score out of 146 applications, and we won. Uh, Jersey split the state up into north, mid, and south. They were giving out two licenses per uh, region, and we were the only one that swept all three regions. But unfortunately, they, they said we're not giving you three licenses. We're going to give you one, but we gave you the northern one because we figured that would be the one you wanted right. because it has the most people and uh, closer to New York. Closer to yeah, yeah. best yeah. access points to New York and all of that. Very so cool. we we it's amazing because that uh, that license that we won at the end of 2018 we finally just opened it up in the last few months. It oh, takes wow. you know so that's after a, a lot of money and a lot of time that shows you how long it takes to uh, right. stand these things up. So it's what just, do you do once you get the license? Are you now looking for a partner in a grower and, and a brander, or you, do you already have the ideas that you want to go for? Do you have them lined up that you're going to plug them into your license? So that's right. the idea. Okay. Right. Uh, well, I, I think that that's a good uh, that that tees me up well for the next acquisition oh, that good. we made, and you'll see how it fits together. Very good. The next acquisition that we made after the apothecarium was a uh, was the number one uh, operator, cultivator, and manufacturer of branded products in Pennsylvania. Uh, they're called uh, Ilera Healthcare. Oh, okay. Uh, and they owned uh, around 20% of the market. Uh, the Pennsylvania market was, uh, was and is a very good market. It's, it's a medical uh, state, mm -hmm. but it is a, uh, they allow a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, they allow the doctors to write for a lot of different indications. Mm -hmm. So, it's, uh, so it, it, it's a market that's done really well. You know, currently it's over a $1.1 billion uh, uh, retail uh, market. Wow. So at the time it, it was probably half that size, but we bought uh, this operator uh, there. We closed on that deal in uh, September of 19. Uh, and the plan was it wasn't just what we were buying, uh, but uh, they were planning a, th a 3x uh, increase in their cultivation capacity. And Pennsylvania, like, like most of the East Coast uh, states, are limited license states where there's generally the, the, imba the imbalance is uh, it's, more of a, uh, it's more of a seller's market than a, than a buyer's market. The, the, mar the market is, you know, uh, is, you know, uh, skews towards being undersupplied. So we knew that if we tripled cultivation, uh, and manufacturing that we would be able to, we, we thought we were going to be able to sell it all through. Very so, cool. uh, so we closed on that deal in uh, September of, uh, of 19, uh, built, finished the build out by December, planted all of those rooms. Uh, and then in uh, you know, the first quarter of 20, which is now not that long ago, yeah. all of that product started flowing through, uh, showing up in our sales. And uh, overall, Terrasen, just to show you the progression in terms of 
revenue, and we report in Canadian dollars, although we're switching to the U.S. dollars for, the, for, uh, for 2021. Mm -hmm. um, but in the fourth quarter of 19, we did 25 million Canadian in sales and a $5 million uh, adjusted EBITDA loss. So that was before we brought on that extra capacity. Right. Then. Q1, we had that product. Uh, we had we had you know flour for sale just in the last month of Q1. So we did 35 million in sales, but with a five million dollar adjusted EBITDA profit. Q2, we had all the capacity for the whole quarter. So we did um, uh, 47 million dollars in sales and 11 and change million in EBITDA. Q3, we did 51 and a half million, I believe, in sales and, and just under 18 million in, in uh, EBITDA. And um, we haven't reported Q4 yet, so I can't give you the exact numbers, but I can tell you what we said. Uh, yeah. We brought it on another 30% uh, capacity increase. In Q3, it was finished and planted. That doesn't show up for a few months later. So we have already told the street that it will show up in, for part of Q4. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, gave, we ended up giving, uh, we had given uh, yearly uh, guidance. guidance for the whole year, mm -hmm. uh, starting, I think, in, in August, uh, which we raised a couple of times. But uh, in the beginning of December, we raised guidance again, and we said that we, the company would do for the year at least 195 million Canadian in sales, uh, and at least, I believe, uh, 54 million in EBITDA, which if, if you back it all out, it comes out to, uh, uh, over 20 million in, in EBITDA for Q4. And we also gave guidance for 2021, uh, which was, I believe, 360 to 380 million in Canadian in sales and 140 to 160 million in EBITDA. So, good so good growth. Scaling you know, nicely, it. yeah. I mean, once you turn the corner there and, and you had the addition, added the capacity, I mean, I guess the market was there waiting for it. The market was there waiting, waiting for it. It, it, took, it took everything, uh, the, the, that capacity increase at the end of last year, or, or I'm sorry, in the first quarter of, uh, yeah, first quarter of 2020. Uh, and then it's also taken all the increase that we just brought online in the, in the last few months. And then in terms of overall for TerraSend, the reason you have such a jump for 2021 is, uh, you know, continued growth in Pennsylvania. But now we finally have New Jersey has come online. And New Jersey, it just worked out pretty yeah. well. Jersey went uh, rec uh, or, a, or approved rec uh, yep. on the ballot uh, in November. It was like, I don't know, 70 to 30, I yeah. think, in terms of it was pretty- uh, Yeah, pretty, uh, well supported. Well supported. Well supported. Well, yeah. Right, exactly. And, uh, and we, as of right now, we just finished the second phase of our cultivation uh, facility in New Jersey. And as of right now, we have the largest uh, facility and the largest capacity uh, in, in the state. In the and there's going to be, you know, you got to believe there's going to be a lot of demand. The market is undersupplied for medical. Right. Like even if, even if REC didn't kick in for, for a few years, we will we'll sell all of our product, uh, you know, wholesale right. to, to everybody else and through our own uh, dispensaries uh, under medical. But REC, which, which will actually be implemented, we believe, uh, sometime around the summer or uh, the yeah. beginning of the fall, that's going to uh, create even more demand. Yeah. Um, you know, and that is going to be, in terms of from a wholesale perspective, we can only sell what we, you know, we, we've got to sort of have a maximum amount that we can sell. Unless prices go up, you know, there's a chance prices could go up, you know, on a per pound basis mm -hmm. significantly. That would have, that would be, you know, pretty Creative. much all, all profit, you know, right. to, to us or almost all of it. And that's medical or, or rec, or I guess rec, like I said, could in increase prices a little more. But the dispensaries, those are, the, those are the ones that are going to see a substantial increased run rate uh, when REC kicks in. Right. Because generally, uh, a good dispensary, you know, on, like say our Pennsylvania dispensaries, those are, you know, 15 to 20 million-ish uh, dollar a year dispensaries, which are amazing. You know, I have a friend who was a top guy at Starbucks. I said, what do your best stores do? You know, their average stores do like two million. Their best stores do five million. Is that right? Yeah. Well, they're everywhere. But, but they're yeah, everywhere. It's good to know. And their yeah. inputs are a little cheaper. Yeah. As well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, less regulation. Right. But uh, these stores. I mean, if you look at New Jersey, New Jersey is under you know stored. There's not as many compared to Pennsylvania. Underserved, Pen essentially. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, right. Yeah. Pennsylvania is uh, in terms of stores or dispensaries. Pennsylvania has a hundred dispensaries for about twelve million people in PA. They have 100 dispensaries, and they're going to be going to 200 dispensaries over the next year, year or so. Yeah. Uh, and it's a over a billion dollar uh, market at, at retail. New Jersey has 9 million people, so a little smaller, but it's going to be wreck. 
So you're gonna get a lot more demand. And it only has, right now, there's only 13 dispensaries in the whole state. And they're probably, there's no way, based upon the licenses that they've given out, there's no way there can be more than 36. But some of those were licenses that were given out three years ago, and, the, and you, these teams couldn't get it they together. Never, they and never activated on They them never so activated it, right. So my guess is there's probably you know, uh, a max, really, of like 25 to 30 dispensaries that will be open come uh, rec. Yeah. And if we, like, to me, there's no way that Jersey can't, it can't be, uh, there's no way that Jersey is less than a billion dollars at retail under rec if Pennsylvania is already well over a billion uh, under medical, right? No doubt, right. But if there's only, say there's 25 stores, that means on average every store is gonna do $40 million. Yeah. Uh, but really, the biggest driver uh, in limited license states and limited supply states, the biggest driver of what are the best dispensaries are the, are the dispensaries that are the best supplied with the best selection, uh, most, most uh, SKUs, and just uh, gotcha. most inventory, so you're not sold out half the time. Right. So if we have the largest uh, facility from a capacity perspective, how are we not gonna have the best supplied stores? 100%. So I feel like, you know, I don't wanna get too crazy, but there's a chance these could be 50, 60 million dollar a year stores. It ends up coming down to like, it's not, a, it's not a matter of how much demand or how much product, it comes down to how many people can you get through the doors. Yeah. You know, how, do we have enough parking? Do we have enough uh, point of sales? Do we have, it reminds me of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chipotle. Right. I don't know if you remember like 10 years ago before they had their problems with food poisoning and all yep. that. It would, every quarter they reported it was, how efficient did we get in pushing more people through the doors and through the registers? Yeah. Um, and that's sort of what we're thinking about. We, we have to figure out how to be as efficient as possible. So you're now, you're now pivoting toward you know, distribution network expertise as very much a part of you know, what was the genesis of you know, your banking into the growing, into the licenses, into yeah. the whole progression. And now you're finding your next, I think probably, um, I would say your next uh, thing to tackle is going to be how to get it all out, right? And you, I'm sure you have some ideas on that. And yes, that's yeah. going to be fascinating to watch, man. Yeah. Now let, let's let's let, let's talk about that. That story like blew me away, and it, I was so proud to just listen to it. And I love oh, that you were you. positioned from. Now it's just it's just that you hung the shingle out, and and that is what paid off in the end. But you know it was a lot of those big steps that you confidently made in 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 the process that are really impressive and, and mm -hmm. you deserve the sort of luck that you fell into along the way because there was a little bit, you know what I mean? There's a little bit of things opening up, not that you didn't plan for them, yeah. but you made it all happen and, and the market cooperated, yeah. right? Yeah. With your plan a little yeah. bit. And you have to shift on the fly also. Yeah, when always. you realize the facts are different, you have to change. Yeah, that's entrepreneurial shift, that's trading, that's like everything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And, right, so the, the, and the guys that change, and the guys that are happy to change their mind are usually the guys that win in the end, when, if you ask me, in terms of trading, in terms of, you know, it's about being open to seeing what's coming next. 100 percent. I'll give you one quick example. We were worried when we decided to go into the U.S. Uh, with Terrasen. We kept it. We really made a point to keep it secret until we were able to announce, uh, you know, the, the reorganization. Because we were worried that all of these other Canadian LPs were going to somehow get this idea and follow Piggyback. us in. Right. Sure. Here's the thing. Not one of them did it. Other. I mean, Canopy Growth. Did they owned a piece of us, and then they did the deal with because Acreage. of you? But uh, yeah, but but nobody else. You would have thought that you know all of these other Canadian companies, or the big goal of, that they had was to to uplist to the to the TSX to the Toronto Stock Exchange, which was the bigger, uh, yeah. you know, more legitimate exchange. Uh, we were on and the CSC. Yeah. So we, if you went to the TSX, then you couldn't go. You couldn't operate in the U.S. And all of those other companies. They decided to either stay on the TSX or to uplist on to the TSX. Therefore, not uh, not operate. Take advantage. You know, and and from day one, uh, you know, at Terrasend, I always told everybody at the company, you know, don't focus on the stock. You know, the uh, I think it's a Warren Buffett quote: uh, short term, the market is a voting machine, and long term, the market is a weighing machine. And the only way we're going to get paid is if is if we build a real business, right? right. That has real cash flow and well profits put. and all the rest. And my view is. All of those other Canadian companies, they were playing the voting machine. Mm -hmm. They refused to give up being yeah. on the TSX or the opportunity to be in, to be in the U.S. on the U.S. exchanges, uh, and therefore they couldn't build themselves for the weighing machine in terms of being able to build a real business because that kept them out of the U.S. Right, right. 
so they were just being, you know, on the spot opportunistic with the with the disco ball in front of them. And they were like, okay, we can make this work. We can monetize this. We have to get to the exchange. And you were like, I'm going to the United States. Because I need to build a real business. 100%. Because otherwise, I'm not, we're not going to, this is going to all be a mirage. Right, right. You know? Where are we going now? Where are we going now, Jason? I mean, we're, yeah, it, we're, it, it's, it's going. I mean, it's going. The stocks are going. You know, it's very difficult to make judgments if you've been holding these a long time and saying, is this the kind of thing that I've quadrupled my money and I should sell? Or is this the thing that you kind of just fold your hands for a little while because you don't want to sell the first day of a breakout? Yes. So I'm generally, and when people ask about this, p people who don't know the, mar you know the stock market very well, they always ask me, like, what's the key to making money in the market? And I always tell them, to me, the number one rule in the stock market is hold your winners and sell your losers. And most people do the opposite. And that's why most individual investors don't make money. Right. Uh, they hold on to, you know, uh, they hold on to their bad ones forever and they, and they cut their, their right. winners back and they always say, you know, nobody ever went poor taking a profit. Right. But you do go poor if you always sell your winners up 10% and you hold on to your losers forever. Right. You know, you, you can go poor taking profits. Holding on to the losers for me is not changing your mind, right? Right. If you've, got, if you've got an asset that is consistently depleting and mentally draining you, then you need to change your mind. That's how I look at this. So, so that's it. But, you, you know, you can tell that to a lot of people but it's just the way they're wired. Mm -hmm. And I'm wired for some reason, the opposite. Like Same. if I have a stock that keeps going up every day, I'm like, you know, allergic to, to selling it. Like I can't, or, you know, very often I'll buy more if they, if they've uh, fundamentally, they've uh, done their better position. Than, I, than I thought that they were sure. gonna do. Yeah. So, so that's, uh, that's sort of how I'm wired. Uh, so that's, just, you know, that is, uh, uh, to answer your question in terms of, do we sell these things or, I mean, you know, I love them. You know, uh, you know, in 2019 when they were all going down every day and mainly being brought down by the Canadian, Canadian uh, companies. Excesses, yeah, yeah. Uh, then I wasn't, I wasn't too happy. Uh, but, uh, but I, uh, you know, generally, if I have a stock that's going down every day and it's, it's on my screen and like bothering me, like I just want to sell it because I don't, I don't want to look Same at it. Same thing. Anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like stomach aches. Yeah. I hate yeah, that. Yeah. Same but, thing. But generally, at this point, uh, the the sectors uh, overall, the sector, it, it, especially the U.S., is doing really well. We made made a ton of progress, obviously, uh, uh, in a lot of ways over the last nine months. Huge. Uh, you know, it's interesting. COVID was when we were going uh, into COVID, we went through our and we, and we still own you know non-cannabis names. So we were going through our whole portfolio um, uh, and saying, you know, which which of these companies are haves and which are have-nots uh, with what could happen with with COVID and if it gets really bad. And we looked through uh, you know. Uh, a bunch of our names or overall the overall market and we like we said Amazon looks like you know that's a half right. you know people are going to you know even it's going to even accelerate people you know uh, getting everything delivered to the house and not going out to the store and yeah. all that uh, and you know uh, cruise lines those were obviously have nots right yep. <laughs> um, but when we got to cannabis it was like uh, we didn't know whether it was going to be a have or a have not I mean, I made the arguments of, you know, people are going to be sitting at home a lot more, have a lot more time on their hands. You know, one of the leading indications that people use cannabis for is anxiety. Mm -hmm. Everybody's uh, anxious. Uh, people can't sleep. You know, that's another thing that it's used for. I felt like that could increase demand. Yeah. But it was also, you know, if the whole economy, uh, you know, goes down the tubes, people aren't going to be able to afford it, right. anything. So two months into COVID, we realized cannabis was was a have and not a have not. It was uh, it was it was deemed essential in practically every uh, state. And think about how far we've come in terms of getting rid of the stigma around cannabis. If you told me that five years ago or ten years ago, I would totally. have thought that that was uh, that was uh, you know uh, crazy. So it was deemed deemed essential. All uh, practically every state allowed uh, uh, all of the cannabis operators to stay to stay open. Mm -hmm. um, so that was uh, that was a definitely a, a big positive. Yeah. And demand went up yeah. because everybody, like I said, had more time on their hands, was anxious, uh, couldn't sleep. Uh, demand went up uh, significantly, um, and. Over the, over the next few months, everybody also realized that these state budgets were gonna have a huge hole in them in terms of from tax receipts, and that cannabis was going to be, uh, could be a big part of the solution. Yep. So you started hearing a, lo a lot more governors talking about how uh, they were gonna push through cannabis legalization, or you know, at least for, uh, at least the first medical, or if they were already medical, that, that they were gonna push to have it go uh, you know, adult use or, or rec. Mm -hmm. So that was another uh, big driver, uh, and even the uh, you know the whole Black Lives Matter movement dovetailed well with cannabis because, as I mentioned earlier, there are still people sitting in jail right now. You know, lots of them for, for cannabis, uh, like that, yeah, right? for yeah. cannabis convictions, and it is uh, and cannabis. You know, uh, 
uh, uh, African Americans have been incarcerated uh, to uh, you know to a much uh, larger extent than uh, than everybody else for cannabis crimes. So this, so a lot of the states see this as part of the solution to to help uh, sort of make things right with. Uh, it's a friendly play into social awareness, if that's yes. fair to say. It's a, it's a, it's for a sure. it's a kind way to to you know show some facts and say we can support this with with facts of incarceration, and so we have a way to make it better now. We have a way, so, absolutely, and we need to stop arresting people. Yeah, we need yeah. to legalize it just because we shouldn't be arresting anybody anymore. Right, that's for, that's for sure. I always yeah. love reading old headlines about all the times that Mick Jagger and Keith Richards got arrested for marijuana going through the airport and you're like, wow, man, if, you know, they had timed this a little better, it would have been um, no, no problem. But yeah. we are at the absolute, you know, uh, pinnacle of this conversation because they are roaring to new highs right now. Yep. It sounds like you would be in more of the mindset to let this trade play and right. let this trade play out. My idea is that I've got some cannabis holdings and my idea is that I'm not going to let go of any of them until Fidelity is the number one holder of one of them. What do you think about that kind of strategy? Or, you know, I've, I've fully bought into, you know, Todd Harrison's idea that we've discussed about we have got a chance to front run all the big boys now that are very soon going to come in with, can you buy me XYZ at the market cannabis company because I have to get this pile of money into it, you know? So that's going to be an exciting time. Well, it's, it started. So what, started. what I would say is, uh, when was it? Last A couple of weeks ago, the Georgia election. Right. That was a huge, huge. huge. And I think that even in my own mind, I understated the uh, importance of it. Yeah. But I will tell you, for TerraSend, we, uh, we were planning on going out to raise $50 million uh, last Friday. Uh, and the plan, we, we've done all of our deals as private placements, which are better because you bring in longer term money because it's, you know, four month old and it's, yeah. you know, not that easy to transact. Right. So that's the way we've always done it. And what we usually did is we went out to, we brought a few people over the, a few funds over the wall at first. So uh, we tried to build uh, some book and then we would publicly announce it and say, you know, the plan here was, We'll, uh, we'll build a book for 30 or $40 million worth of orders, and then we'll announce it publicly that we're gonna raise 50, and then we end up getting a lot of calls and, and fill in the rest. That was the plan. We went out on Friday to about five or six accounts, and I couldn't, first of all, they were US, much larger US accounts that we had never spoken to in the past, uh, and we ended up getting uh, over 150, Oversubscribed. Million, $150 million worth of orders. We only wanted to raise uh, 50 million. Uh, so, so that is, to me, that was the direct result of what happened in Georgia, Georgia yeah. where all of these funds, I mean, the smallest, uh, the smallest fund in, uh, that, uh, that gave us an order was, uh, was a three and a half billion dollar U.S. hedge fund. So it was like a three and a half billion dollar one, a five billion dollar one, a seven and a half billion dollar one, and then there was a twenty-three billion dollar mutual fund complex, uh, which they were the only ones that were okay with being publicly announced. You know, hedge funds like to be a little yeah, yeah, more yeah. Uh, secretive, yeah. uh, but that was uh, Wasatch, uh, Wasatch uh, Global Canada, Investors, Wasatch, yeah. which is uh, a Salt Lake City of all places, uh, uh, yeah. mutual fund complex. And I gotta give them credit. They they are already, they showed up in, in their Q3 filing of being the, like the number three or number four shareholder in Terrasen as it was, okay. uh, but they came in for uh, $27 million on this last deal, but we had, I had two orders for 60 million US dollars each. Uh, we had uh, another, uh, we had 27 million from Wasatch, we had a $20 million one from, the, from another fund, and then we had you know, one for 17 and one for, uh, I forgot what it was, one for seven. Um, just to show you how much of a change that was, we've, we've had three other financings over the last couple of years, private placements, we never got an order for over $7 million. Holy Other than from my fund was, right. was bigger and canopy growth, uh, you know, uh, yeah, but this uh, is fund. outside interest. This is people that aren't necessarily doing the homework you're doing, right? They're doing their own homework and deciding that this is where they want to go, and that's important. Yeah, and it was, and and the, the decision was, it was like the first time we spoke to them, they pretty much gave us this order, and it was just such a change versus, uh, you know, just like you know, we just did a financing last May, in May of twenty, you know, where we didn't get more than a seven struggle. million dollar order, and now not only that, we were getting like the the two sixty million dollar orders. They were like, you know, pitching, pitching me like, I really want the full 60 million. We're going to be supportive uh, uh, investors and we really like this and, you know, all of that, which was, I, it, it just, uh, it like, you know, was, was sort of shocking yeah. uh, to me. So we ended up announcing uh, 
we uh, $175 million private place when we announced it a couple of days ago. And, uh, and, and 80% of it was with four large institutional investors. Brilliant. Uh, one of them, uh, Wasatch. That's phenomenal. So, so that's, uh, so I think that the answer change. It. Like they are, uh, you know, uh, uh, Todd yeah. uh, has been talking for, I, I don't know, it must be nine or 10 months already about the barbarians at the gate and they're yeah. coming. Like, you know, uh, I think they're inside the gates to right. a certain extent. So they've infiltrated. The the pack. Right. They, they may not be, um, we may not be able to see their footprints on the tape, but they're sneaking in under the wire right now. And yes. that's very yes, interesting. Yes, exactly. And, that, and I think that's just going to continue, especially, you yeah. know, a big part of it also is, uh, you know, it's not coincidence that the whole U.S. cannabis space, you know, bottomed sometime uh, last summer mm -hmm. and started started doing really well from there. From there, it wasn't because they were oversold or, tech, you know, uh, it wasn't any technical reasons. It was because all of the, uh, you know, or at least the top five or six U.S. companies started putting up positive, uh, you know, at least uh, EBITDA uh, numbers. Right. Uh, so it, it really, it, it goes back to like the voting machine and the weighing machine. Yeah. They first started going up uh, to a large extent based on, on the weighing machine and the yeah. fact that they were actually, you know, like, you know, Terrasend, you know, like took off as, as soon as we sort of started, you know, talking about, uh, you know, those numbers that yeah. or, or reporting those numbers, you know, in terms yeah. of those Q1, Q2, As Q3. it was showing up, right? As, as yeah. it was showing up. That's yeah. Really so, so that's part, I think, of what's brought in uh, more, uh, you know, bigger institutional money. But then the whole, uh, you know, uh, uh, Georgia and also seeing uh, the election in November, you know, I saw a lot of uh, uh, smart headlines that said, you know, uh, that, you know, cannabis won the election or, you know, yeah. uh, in the war on drugs, uh, you know, because there was also psychedelics were approved in a lot of states, uh, right. uh, you know, uh, the, you know, in the war on drugs, uh, you know, drugs won. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> sure. Hey, let, let, let's touch on that because we've we've covered amazing stories in cannabis. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the unknowns, right, that are associated with the sector. And as you said, they have just legalized, um, how, how do we put it? Um, or decriminalized. Decriminalized or, psilocybin, yeah. is that the right way? Psilocybin. Psilocybin, I and yeah. I'm, as a, I'm obviously a rookie in this, but yeah. take us through it. Is there a future in that, in trading it, in investing it? Does it seem like something that they're just doing that's hand in glove with recreational marijuana that they're pushing over the line? Or, you know, is this something you're focusing on or is this a uh, side story that is not as investable? So I guess my real question. I think it's less investable. I mean, yeah. part of what I part of what I love and always loved about cannabis is that we know that there's this hundred plus billion dollar cannabis economy and and you know demand for cannabis. It's just that you know we practically a hundred percent of it was it was illegal. the illicit market, right? Right. And part of the play was moving that from the illicit market to the legal market, yeah. and 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 we're going to be able to capture some of that and the stigma going away and everybody yeah. realizing that this is. Uh, it's about wellness. It's yeah. not about the, uh, you know, uh, what we, you know, 10 years ago, you would have thought people who were, you know, in, into cannabis were, you know, sitting on the couch and eating potato chips and playing video games. And now it's all about right. people doing yoga and yeah. be, being vegans and all that. So that's why I love Huge cannabis. Huge change, yeah. Huge change. We had, a, we had more demand coming in and the stigma going away. And the huge movement from the illicit market to the to the legal market. Most importantly, we're lifting the propaganda veil, right? More importantly than just the natural, this is not good, this is good. There was a clampdown on propaganda to keep it illegal and everything. And now we're talking about, when you talk to somebody about they have cannabinoid receptors in their body, they go, huh? Yeah. Right, and that's the sort of, for me, that's been the gateway to say to people, well, this is how it works, you know? And, and, and your body has been craving this stuff, whether you know it or not, so. Uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so that's all. Those are the reasons that I, that I you know, uh, it fits the wellness, believer. wellness package it in fits America it all. right now. And so plant beautiful. medicine and, yeah. you know, everything. Everything is plant, you know, the whole plant-based movement, you know, whether it's yeah. plant-based food, yeah. but this is plant-based medicine. Right. So, so that's, you know, that's why I'm still a huge believer and think that we're, you know, only in the, you know, maybe the bottom of the first inning yeah. when it comes to the cannabis industry. So the psychedelics, on the other hand, my view there is that they definitely, I definitely am a believer in psychedelics as a therapy. That, that, that it has the ability to help people, uh, really, really help people. Really? Like, yeah, and uh, you know, I've seen some really interesting data and I totally believe it. And even personally, you know, when I was in college, you know, long time ago uh, uh, at the University of Wisconsin, uh, my, my junior year in college, I, I tripped on you know, LSD with my friends and it changed my life. Mm -hmm. for, for the better. Mm -hmm. Something just changed, that some, I don't know if there's some new connections in my brain or something like that. Really, consciously but, you feel that, right? Oh, I know it. Really? Yeah, I know it. I mean, my friends, all they all called me uh, for the next year or so, they all called me PT, post-trip. 
Like it was, it was a complete change. Amazing. Uh, you know, much more confident. Just like I just felt like uh, I was sort of uh, I, I saw things more clearly, and and I also like realized that I felt like I was right. You know, like yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Like there is a, something of clarity about that, right? There, clarity, there definitely exactly. is a clarity moment about that type of uh, mind-altering drug, if we will. Exactly. Not that you know, and and uh, I did it again like uh, six months later, and it didn't have that same effect. So it's not like I did it all the time, but. Um, so I definitely believe in that, that these psychedelics could help a lot of people. The only problem is, back to comparing it to cannabis, there's no substantial industry in psychedelics. Right. What could it be, a billion dollars worldwide or something, uh, maybe a couple of billion dollars? I mean, yeah. yeah. So the people that are following the jam bands around the country are probably yeah, half, yeah, right. the, half the market or something like that. Right, right. I mean, what is it? What could it be? It can't be, it can't be that much. So that's why, that's just from an investing perspective, there, there could be things that, that changed the world in a positive way, but that nobody really makes a lot, a whole, any money on it. Understood. Right? Yeah, that's fair. So, so that's uh, that's my view on the psychedelics. And then, and the other issue is there's no, there's, I don't really see many barriers to entry. You know, there's some companies that are trying to do it by setting up clinics where you come in and you're under, you know, uh, doctors, uh, you know, the uh, the supervision of a doctor, and they make sure that everything goes well and all that. But but anybody could do that. Mm -hmm. You know, all you all you need is an office. You know, an office space, and you know, part of the cannabis industry, uh, or even where I've gravitated, we've gravitated towards in cannabis is we want to be in limited, licensed states uh, because there's a barrier to entry and and there's less competition. Mm -hmm. So I haven't really seen many defensible business models in the psychedelic space. A bunch of companies are working on uh, you know actual getting drugs approved by the FDA, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, I hope they, I hope they get them approved and I yeah. hope that they work and something and we should efficacy. root for. Yeah. Yeah. Something we should root for. Yeah. But like part of, uh, you know, uh, starting in around 2014 and 2015, I wanted to get, I wanted to, you know, sort of pivot away from regular pharma and dealing with, you know, uh, FDA risk and dealing with insurance reimbursement and yeah. things like that, because yeah. it was getting harder. And my view was like cannabis, is part of the pharmaceutical uh, sector. It's just to me, it was the only part that I that I think and I still think is going to significantly grow and outpace the rest of the the pharma industry over the next twenty years. Hundred percent. So these other companies that are doing things that are trying to go to the regular pharma route, like you know, I that's uh, that's less attractive to me. I don't you know uh, insurance these insurance companies like you know in terms of pharma, they don't want to pay for anything. Like mm -hmm. you, you know, I, you know, yeah. I want to be in products that are uh, that are not covered by insurance companies. Yeah, that's more because, exciting because they sure. make it very, very difficult to drive demand. So, so overall, I haven't like I don't. That's why I don't really see psychedelics. Everyone's talking about it. it's going to be the next big thing, and maybe based upon just the uh, sort of the way the market is rewarding themes, and you know, it's, whether it's Bitcoin yep. or you know, and Tesla is uh, you know certainly shown people that stocks can go up. Uh, you know, sort of irrespective of of a multiple fundamentals, they, et cetera, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so I feel like the psychedelic space it could work, and there's a lot of companies that have been, uh, you know, doing reverse mergers and, and coming public. Mm. Uh, but it's just more a matter back to you know, voting machine and weighing machine. Yeah. I need to be comfortable that I that I'm invested in a business that's yeah. gonna that that if the market doesn't work. Uh, that I'm still, you know, yeah, I, gonna I, do okay. I like the idea of, of, of chasing the 800 pound marijuana gorilla that we know is stomping around out there than, than chasing the cat, you know, around for the psychedelics. It doesn't, I, I'm sort of in the same vein. Yeah. I'm curious to what you, you, you seem like you've got such vision with this, Jason, that it's impressive. I, w I want to take me into the future of, of cannabis, right? Do we, do we come down to a point where we've got a fang complex in cannabis and there are these three or four, you know, if we had to nail the US operators now, we would probably have to say like True Leaf, Green Thumb, Cura Leaf, and Cresco Labs, potentially. Those are the top four. Yeah. Harrison's number five. So five, whenever and, I see anybody on Twitter, I'm like, what do you mean the four horsemen? It's the top that's it's where the five. That's where we're going now. Okay, <laughs> so we're going with a fang plus, which is five letters as well, and that's yeah. fine. And that's, that's included right now. I, I, I I already see you in the fang complex of yeah. cannabis going forward. Do yeah. you believe in those other companies? Yeah, uh, absolutely. You I mean, do? They are they're legitimate operators. Yeah. They have proven themselves. That's why they have the size businesses that that they have. Yeah. Um, and a lot of them have been doing it for a long time. They have a lot of experience. Yep. Uh, and I yeah, I like I like all of those. We own all of those companies. We don't right. I mean, my uh, I try to uh, another aspect of the way I try to run my portfolio is I really try to be concentrated yeah. in, in the positions I, I like the most. Yep. And it gets, I realize like, 
as a fund gets bigger, I, I think that there's a natural um, you know, progression that, that, that people end up uh, having less concentrated positions, maybe because the fund manager looks at it from a dollar perspective as opposed to a percentage of the portfolio yeah. perspective. And I've really always actively uh, tried to uh, not have that be the case with me because you know when I look at my portfolio or, you know, over the years, like my top five positions or my top three stocks that I like the most, they usually do a lot better than my number 17 stock. Yeah. So I really try, you know, Peter Lynch uh, calls it a, you know, a, a diversification. I try to not to, to diversify in terms of, of owning too many names or, yeah. or not concentrating in the things that I, that I like the best because uh, I, then you just end up, you end up, uh, you know, having less single stock risk but you end up just with market risk. Yep. And there's and it's like practically impossible to swim against a really tough market if you own the market. Yep. That's an approach we've taken. And in terms of, I own all of those other ones, but it's nothing compared to right. my Terrasent position. Naturally. And also because Terrasent is, you know, has worked and and I've, let it, and I've let it grow when I haven't, you know, uh, and don't plan on, you know, cutting right. it cutting it back. No. Um. So uh. So yeah. So so I own those. We also um, uh, have a large position in in GrowGen which was sort of an, an ancillary play. Mm -hmm. And uh, we invested in them about two years ago. My view there was these guys can list on, a, on US exchanges and that's a way to play. You know, you, you, a lot of investors in the cannabis space have gotten frustrated by the fact that these Canadian companies that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ, that they go up sometimes more than the US companies go up uh, when there's good news about the U.S., yeah, right. Yep. And my view was, and and they trade at higher multiples uh, yeah. than the U.S. ones, at least on a price to sales. Yeah. Uh, and certainly price to price to earnings, because most of them don't have any EBITDA, right? Right. But uh, that was my thought. I was like, GrowGen, that's a way for somebody if they'll only invest on in a U.S. exchange, that's a way for them to at least be leveraged to the U.S. cannabis industry. Yeah. So that was my view with GrowGen, right. and uh, you know, it's certainly. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's been it's been a good performer. They built a good, they built a, a really nice uh, business. Uh, but you know, the argument that uh, you know people have now is that it, that it's expensive. But it's it's partly because it's like there is uh, there's there's not a lot of other ways right. if, it, to, to to play the U.S. industry if you if you won't buy you know bulletin board or CSE listed stocks. Right, right, right. I feel like there's going to be some reflexivity with the big names, and I'm sure yours as well. Where the bigger you get, the easier it gets to operate. The more access to capital, the easier your distribution will get. And so that's why I, you know I mean I'm I've been a seething bull from the beginning, and now that they're now that it's happening. You know, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out what, what the next move is, because in my, you know, as a pure tactical trader, I'm expecting both the U.S. and the election and the Georgia elections to be sell events. Right. I'm just expecting that the run up is due to that news. And then we're going to see a big fallback. And because we haven't seen one, I'm like itching because I've taken a lot of profit on the rally. And that's why I'm talking to you and getting right back into cannabis bull mode yeah. where there's, you know, steam coming out of my nose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's what it really feels like now. Like we just steamrolled through all of this heavy news and they're bid only on the other side of it. So to me, that's. You know that that's something where we want to get repositioned as tactical traders, and I know you're a much different investor, and that's that's a different game. So from this point in time, Jason, we've got the stocks on the highs, we've got the narrative playing out beautifully. It seems to be driving prices. We want to think about making money in the sector, right? Say we're thinking about making money in the sector, but we haven't dipped a toe in yet, right? How do we think about this? Should we think about picking our favorite company and putting money into it? Should we sit back and wait for a massive dip and, and something, to, uh, something to give? Or should we just focus on finding what the right operator is and the one that's going to be the success in 10 years and start moving toward that? That's what I always get spun up with. I, I, I try to decide if I should buy 20 of these names and I know one of them is going to be the hit or if I should say, you know, do 10 days worth of homework and pick one. Yeah. What, what do you like, you know, what, what is your posture and speak to that for me if you can. Yeah, sure. So, so over the, over the last uh, year and a half or so, my thinking has evolved a little bit from the investing perspective, you know, for my fund and for, and for Terrasen as well, where I sort of realized that the companies that were the deepest were the ones that were, that were doing the best. I mean, mm -hmm. Truly is a, is a great example. They were almost completely focused on Florida up until, up until more recently. Yep. 
and and you know and they were crushing it there. They owned like fifty two percent of the market, yep. uh, and their margins were amazing because they were deep and had you know large scale facilities. Amazing branding, large scale facilities. I mean, they they were the McDonald's. They yeah. were the McDonald's of it. Absolutely. So that sort of made me realize that you know uh, as opposed to the models that were you know had pins in the maps and they wanted to be in as say that they were in as many states Spread as possible out geographically. Because and and I realized it was uh, a when you're more focused, you have a better chance chance of winning because you're, you know, because you're focused. And if, if you're competing with, uh, in, in one state and you're competing with a competitor that's in 20 states, they're not going to be able to keep up with you, of right? Of course, you've got lower costs of everything, probably, yeah. right? right? Well, not, yeah, it's it's the scale and it's just the attention, right? right? Mm. So so that was, uh, TrueLeave was sort of a, a good example of that to me. And that's what we did, uh, you know, for TerraSam. We really decided to go as deep as we could, you know, and, and find targets that were that were deep. So Ilara in Pennsylvania was the number one uh, yep. number one uh, operator in in Pennsylvania from you know in terms of cultivating manufacturing, and we've expanded that. So they're even so they're even deeper. Right. Uh, and in Jersey, we decided to go big. I sort of. Uh, I, I annoyingly tell everybody, you, you know, if we're going to get into a state, we got to go big early. Yeah. Like, I, I, I want us to be the biggest operator yes. in that state. And I don't want to be in a state if we can't be a top two or three uh, player in that state. Right. Um, and then also specifically not jump into other states, right? It's like it. it's like the riches are in the niches kind of thing for me. It's like the more specialized you can be, yeah. you open yourself up to that world of specialized draw is the kind of thing. Absolutely. So, you know, for, so for TerraSend, it was uh, Pennsylvania. And New Jersey, and we and we just bought an asset in Maryland, where we also plan on going deep and being one of the uh, being one of the top players there. So that's what we did from from the TerraSet perspective. But even in terms of other companies that I meet with, I want to be in companies that have you know a deep presence and and scale in their states. Uh, if they if I'm comparing one company that's that's in uh, that is 150,000 total square foot of cultivation and manufacturing, but it's uh, because they have uh, five 30,000 square foot facilities in five different states. And I'm comparing that to one, to another company that has 150,000 square feet in one state. Like there's no, uh, there's no debating right. it. That, that, uh, the, the company that's more focused in more one state is going to, has a better chance of winning and is going to have better margins. Yep. So, so that's, that's what we, uh, that, that's what we've been focusing on from, from an investment perspective and, and every day as we meet, meet companies. Also, we really want to be, like I mentioned earlier, in the limited license states. The states out west, a lot of them are, um, you know, unlimited license. You just need to qualify. Right. It's sort of like getting a, dri a driver's license. Yeah. Uh, it's not scored or anything like that. Those are tougher. Those are tougher places to compete because yeah. there's, there's more competition. You're just going to be another Starbucks on the corner, right? Right. So, so that is uh, that. That's an approach we we've, we've taken as well. We were, we are really. Uh, it, it just the uh, the way it's played out is those West Coast states. They are, are, are west of the Mississippi. They had uh, they were first to legalize, and they had these they had uh, cannabis economies that that existed before legalization. Mm. And the goal of legalization was to was to pull these operators into the legal framework. Right. And they were sort of you know uh, building the plane while they were flying it to a certain extent. But that's what ended up making it so that it they weren't limited license because they they didn't want people still operating you know illegally. Mm -hmm. The East Coast did not really have a, a major cannabis economy in terms of cultivation and manufacture. Most of the stuff you know was coming from coming the West from Coast. West. Yeah, sure. So here they were able to build it like uh, not in a way that they they need to make sure they brought everybody in. Therefore, it was more limited and more competitive. And yeah. you know, from an economics perspective, it's easier to compete when there's a lot when there's a lot less competition. The centralization is key, right? The centralization is key. Yep. So that's what we're going to look for. We're going to look for the the names that continue to win and that continue to be, you know, very focused, both geogra geographically focused on their branding, focused on their products, and uh, we're going to keep a super close eye on Terrasen for the next. Uh, on all of your moves and to see how the New Jersey dispensaries are going, et cetera. Yep. And that's going to be exciting to watch. Yep. I'm going to tell you that um, I'm going to beg you to come on this, this uh, Real Vision again for another interview one yep. day, because the only thing I could think of that would be more exciting than hearing this download that we just got was to hear where we're going in six months or something like that. So we're going to stay close in touch, Jason. I am, I'm thrilled and grateful that you came in for this conversation oh. today. Um, Todd wasn't kidding when he was talking about somebody that's long both humility and wisdom and I am oh, really you. really honored to be here with you today so thank you very much thank you thank you it was my pleasure what, what an amazing story so Jason Wild JW asset management 
Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis, visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.